Good morning, City Hill, and welcome to Church Online. My name's Mike, and I have the pleasure of introducing our team to you this week. If you're joining us for the first time, a big warm City Hill hello to you. And just drop us a comment in the live chat so that we're able to connect with you. And if you have any questions or prayer requests as the meeting goes on, please send us an email at info at cityhillglobal.com or use the prayer request button below. Just as a reminder to everyone that our meetings start on Zoom at 10 a.m. each Friday and we join together in fellowship from home as we're no longer to meet in public. This week we'll be continuing our Exodus series led by Mark Bagnall. Firstly, we're going to start with some worship from Vili, but before I hand over to him, I'd like to share with you Psalm 100. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. And with that psalm in mind, let us all get together now and worship. Over to you, Billy. Whoa. 
Hello, City Hill. My name is Fusi, and I have with me here Mark, and uh, we are continuing with our series from Exodus. So today we're going to be looking at Exodus 26, and I'm really excited to find out what it says. Um, we have really enjoyed this um, series, uh, those who've been preaching it, but also I know that there have been a few people who've actually said that they've enjoyed just hearing the Word, the word of God preached from this uh, book it's been it's a very complex passage <laughs> to be honest with you in the bible it's, an, it's not an easy book but um i've seen just the way that people have been able to expand it that it's been so helpful and so good to see that the word of god through the power of the spirit can be so accessible to us so today we are looking at 26 and we have mark who is going to help us in this passage and uh, i want to hand over to you mark thanks fusi now before I get into the passage, I just thought I'd talk to you about relationships. I know it doesn't really look, you know, like a relationship. The first time I, you told me this was the passage, I said, Fusi, this, this just looks like building instructions. Sure. But um, I gather you and Emily, when you guys met, where were you living and where was Emily? Uh, Emily was uh, in China, a city called Dalian, and uh, I was based here in the UAE, Dubai. So that's a pretty long way. Apart. Long distance relationship, yeah. yes, it was. Sometimes distance can make a relationship tricky, can't it? Yeah, I, I don't want to lie. Was it easy? No, it wasn't. It became easier when uh, Emily moved to Dubai. Yeah. And, and I think all of us in Dubai uh, know what that's like because we have family all around the world, don't we? We've all come from somewhere else or we have family that are elsewhere. And so we all have a, an understanding of how this distance is tricky. And what I took out of these, what seems to be just building instructions, is actually, this is God trying to have a relationship with us. And so he is moving closer to his Israelite people so that they can also have a relationship with him. So without further ado, let's see how these building instructions are gonna help God have a relationship with the Israelite people. So, where are we in Exodus? At this point, as we've covered in the last few weeks, we've moved out of Egypt, we're in the Sinai Desert, and Moses already has the Ten Commandments. At this point, he's got some of the law, and now he's gone up the mountain, and he's actually getting instructions from God for how he is going to build the tabernacle. So that's where we're at, and the sections I want to have today that we'll talk about is what is the tabernacle? What does it look like? What's the purpose? Uh, also talking about the idea that God didn't need this tabernacle to be with his people. He has always been and always will be with his people without this physical place. And that leads on to, well, how does God relate with us today? Great. Wonderful. So first of all, do you know how long a cubit is, Fusi? I mean, these instructions are a little bit complex, aren't they? Mark, you're putting me on the spot. Yeah, I know, I know. I, I think a cubit is about that length, elbow to fingertip, but I'm not going to try and explain what all these building instructions mean that we're given in Exodus 26. Great. It's a little bit tricky to decipher. Instead, I'm going to get Vili to put in some pictures so that we can actually look at those to explain sort of the, what this tabernacle sure. looks like. Fantastic. So essentially from these pictures, hopefully you can see there's uh, sort of royal colors. There's linen that's red and purple. Uh, there's some sort of plain linen as well um, to make curtains. There's wooden frames to hold up the tent and they get sort of covered in gold or in the courtyard, they get covered with bronze. Uh, but Essentially, there's a tent surrounded by a big courtyard. The tent has two features, two rooms in it, if you will. So there's the holy part of the tent of meeting, and then there's the most holy, or the holy of holies, is the other smaller room in the tent. Also, it doesn't look like much from the outside. It, it's covered with a roof of animal skins, 
And in fact, even sea creature skins, which I thought was a bit odd for people in the middle of the desert, to have, like either the dolphin or dugong skins. But that's you know to protect the tent Great. in the when bad weather arrives. Yes. So that's kind of what the tabernacle physically looks like, and it was a portable tent so that the people of Israel could carry this around with them as they moved around. Uh, they could pack it up and move it, and they would always have this physical representation of God's house sure. with them. Um, and eventually, this tent would be replicated as a permanent temple in Jerusalem. So was there anything in this tabernacle? Was there anything that kind of symbolized anything, the presence of God or God dwelling amongst the people? Or was it just a, an empty shell? Well, so it wasn't just an empty shell. Funny you should have, uh, I think you knew the answer to that, Fusi. Uh, <laughs> okay. So in the Holy of Holies, the most holy place, there was the Ark of the Covenant. Great. This um, was a box, essentially, that had inside it the Ten Commandments. It had Aaron's staff or rod, and it also had the jar of manna from when God provided manna to the people Great. when they were hungry and starving. So this was essentially a physical representation of God's presence with them. Wow. And the two tablets. Yeah, the tablets of the Ten Commandments in this box. And the people of Israel would use this as a physical representation. Whenever they went moving around the desert, this would go forward in front of them. They would often take it into battle. They carried it around the walls of Jericho before Jericho fell down um, when they went there. So that was why there was this most holy section of the tabernacle. Because something really special was in there. Yeah, that is where God was. Um, so the purpose of this tabernacle was not just for people to go in and say, hi, God. Um, it wasn't like that. The courtyard area, because there's kind of these three areas. There's the outside courtyard, then there's the tent with the two sections. Yes. People could go into the courtyard uh, and there was an altar in the courtyard for offerings. Um, to God. There was also somewhere to wash because if the priests were going into the tabernacle, they'd have ceremonial washing, so have to clean their hands and feet. And so there was a basin in the courtyard they could do that. And then going into the tabernacle tent, only the priests could go into the tent there. They could also offer other offerings to God inside that first section of the tent. But then moving into the most holy of holies, with the Ark of the Covenant, that was very special. Only once a year could the high priest, one person, one man, was allowed in once a year. But when was that? That was the Day of Atonement, which a bit like Eid moves a little bit relative to our calendar these days. But actually, it's coming up, I think, this week or next week for the Jewish people this year. They call that Yom Kippur. Sure. So that's their most holy day of the Jewish calendar was this day of atonement. And that's always a Sabbath in the sense that there's no work, you're to rest, and it's to be a holy day for God. Now, one thing I was really disappointed to discover, Fusi, do you know the story about how the high priest would tie a rope around him to go into the holies? In case he gets struck down by the presence of God, they can just pull him out. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've heard of that theory. I thought that's a great idea because if the high priest is not really careful with how he prepares to go in there and God thinks he's been, I guess, insincere or irreverent, he'll be struck down and killed. So I had heard that the Israelites would tie a rope around him so if he died, they could drag him out rather than have a festering body stay there until the next Day of Atonement next year. Unfortunately, that doesn't seem to be true. It, it seems to be a myth from the Middle Ages. Are you disappointed? That I, I am. I thought that was great thinking and planning and kind of actually showing the reverence to God of we, we don't want to go in there more than once a year. Sure, sure. But anyway, you might have heard that and been tricked as well. Um, I'm a bit sad. Anyway, that's how we see yeah. this holy place. It would, it would strike you down if you did not treat it with the right respect. Wonderful. So you mentioned that you're going to talk a little bit more about this relationship that um, God has with his people and how that works and stuff. How do you want to go about that? Well, 
Interestingly, while here, God is telling them to build a house for him so he can be amongst them. God has always been with his people. We know God created the earth in the beginning and he created in the Garden of Eden a place for Adam and Eve to be together and to be with him. But you'll remember from the Garden of Eden, the reason uh, Adam and Eve were expelled from the garden was God had told them they must not eat from the tree in the center, the knowledge of good and evil. There was also the other tree in the center, the tree of life. So that's kind of, if you will, like the tabernacle's most holy place. Mm, mm. Um, And then when they did eat the fruit that they weren't to eat, they knew God was with them in the garden because they heard his footsteps and they hid. Now, that shows that God has been with his people before. We know also from Exodus, he's represented himself as this pillar of cloud and fire. Um, And so, in fact, Moses is even in the cloud on the mountain when this is, these instructions are given to him. So God has been with his people. Yeah. But to me, this shifts a, shows a shift in their relationship whereby the Israelite people now can come to God. They can bring their sacrifices to him, um, their gifts, their offerings to God so they can come to God rather than just God coming to them Mm. uh it it makes the relationship a little bit more of a two-way street is kind of how i was thinking of it sure um so in this case you are saying that god is not this uh, absentee landlord who is up in the sky somewhere who comes once a year or something but he is now intimately very close to them and that's why you probably were asking about um, emily and i yeah this is the distance And this is where they come, God is coming to be with his people and they can see him and they can go to him. Um, Not necessarily on their terms, but they can can see him. He's got a house there. He's right there. Um, And I suppose that would make it easier for them to see themselves as his people. Sure. And in in Leviticus, the law to follow, God tells them, be holy for I am holy. Yes. Um, You are my people. Um, and he wants them to reflect him. But we also know here they have to keep going to God and keep offering sacrifices to God at this tabernacle or later in the temple. Uh, And so we can see that while that's what their relationship with their God was like as the Israelite people, that's not quite how we relate to God now. Mm. So... This is how God's relationship has changed through time because now we look back and we have Jesus. Mm. So Jesus really was the big change yes. in our relationship with God. Yeah, That's very interesting what you just said there, Mark, because you were speaking of access to God, God coming to dwell in the midst of his people and the people of God can now approach God and go to God. So there's incredible a connection that we've not seen before, that we are beginning to see now with the tabernacle, that God dwells with them and they now have access to God. But you have a, an unholy people, a uh, um, yeah. sinful people, and you have this holy God who says, be holy for I'm holy. And obviously, holiness and unholiness do not mix. So how did they manage to have this intimate access to God if they are unholy? Well, Thanks, Fusi. You'll notice part of this tabernacle is that altar in the courtyard for sacrifice. And anyone who were part of the process for the priests to go into the temple, or indeed the most holy of holies, involved the sprinkling of blood. An animal had to be sacrificed to atone for their sins, uh, to pay the price for being their disobedience towards God, their unholiness. Uh, In fact, Hebrews 9 uh, verse 22 says, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. What does that look like in the New Testament? Well, Fusi, we have Jesus now. He shed his blood. Um, Hebrews obviously is New Testament and references that Old Testament sacrifice but through the light and the lens, if you will, of Jesus being our sacrifice. So 
in the tabernacle or the temple days, we know they were doing repetitive sacrifices. Every day of atonement, sacrifices for the sins of the people. Jesus took all our sin in his one sacrifice. He was the perfect sacrifice uh, for all of us and for our sin and ultimately shows how he came from heaven, from God, as God, to be among us, to walk with us so we could know him. Certainly the people of the time, they saw him, they could touch him, they could, they could really get to know him as a friend. Uh, and then he became their and our sacrifice on the cross to take all our sin in that one go. He was the perfect sacrifice. Sure. So we don't have to go every day of atonement, every year to try and pay for our sins. Wow. Does that mean Jesus, once for all, he was sacrificed to be for us the offering before God that is pleasing to God, that we could never have been able to offer had it not been of Jesus Christ? But yeah. also, does it mean that um, now we have access into the Holy of Holies before God, before the presence of God through this sacrifice that Jesus has made for us? Is that what? It yeah. Jesus is also described as the ultimate high priest for us. Wow. Going into the Holy... In a sense, I guess he came from the Holy of Holies because he was in heaven yes. with God before. And he came to earth uh, as God's representative. And he is the perfect high priest. He doesn't have to go through all this ceremonial washing and sacrifice to present himself to God. He was sacrificed um, to bring us before God. Uh, and that, I think, is the ultimate gesture, not just of building a tent or a temple or a physical place for God to be among his people. God himself was walking among his people as Jesus. And we can relate to Jesus as that way of connecting with God, um, particularly in relation to this tabernacle and the curtain that divides the holy place for all the priests from the most holy of holies. Um, we know that when Jesus died on the cross, the temple was still standing in Jerusalem and the, that curtain was torn with Jesus' death, making a way for us I guess symbolizing that there was no holy of holies that could not be entered anymore. Uh, we could relationship have a relationship with God so because you are, of that sacrifice. Wonderful. So you are saying through Jesus Christ, we now have access to the holy of holies, to the Father, because of Jesus Christ. Yes. Does that absolutely. does that mean if I do not know Jesus? that I can have that access? Or is it something that's just for those who know Jesus? How do we get access to the Father? Oh, that's a tough one. Jesus is for all people that want access to God. We can go to God through him. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Uh, John 14. And if you don't yet know Jesus, he is your way to have a relationship with our Creator, our God. Push the prayer button below this video. Get in touch with us if you've got questions. We would love to help you answer those, explore those, help you get to know Jesus and understand Him better. Because Jesus was sacrificed, sacrificed Himself really for all of us. So there is no exclusive people as the Israelite nation we can all access a relationship with God through Jesus' sacrifice for us. Wow, that's exciting news. I mean, yeah. for, for the world, I guess, because it means through Jesus, all men have an opportunity to engage with God and to have a, this direct relationship with God, which we are seeing now in the scriptures. Yeah, and one thing that I think is really striking about this is that a lot of other worldviews or beliefs their God doesn't want a relationship. Their God is just a judgmental, distant figure. This shows that our God, he wants to know us. He cares for us. And as the, the scriptures often refer to, he's our father. The Lord's prayer, our father in heaven is what Jesus prays. We, um, we can know our God like we know our fathers. Um, and that's the relationship he wants with us.
So in a sense, um, you can have goals that are saying, work hard to come up to me, come up here, yeah. strive as much as you can to get up here where I am. But our God is saying, I'm coming to you. I want to be closer to you. I want to be intimate with you, but also come to me for I'm here. Yes. And there is that sort of um, access that has been granted to us by Jesus as, his, as our mediator. Yes, definitely. And in the light of that, now we are the temple of God on this earth. We are his representation here. Uh, it says in uh, Corinthians, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit lives in you? So we are to be his representation on earth. We are to, to take his message forth. And again, in 1 Peter, it quotes that Leviticus, be holy for I am holy. So we are to be holy and to represent God in our world today, to shine his love, his care to those around us, to a world that you know, is in trouble. So as you said, if you want to reach out, you need to know Jesus and you want to know our God. He's there for you. We would love to help you. And we also are charged with taking that forth, not just waiting for people to come to us, but we need to, to take that into the world and take Jesus to people who don't know him. So there's an argument here to be made, and that is that just because God, Jesus, comes and intercedes for us, and he's before the Father, and he takes away our sins, and he represents us before the Father, and we enter the, the, you know, the presence of God because Jesus is doing that on our behalf, yes. and we are seated with Christ in the heavenly places in Christ, that we have that access, that although that's the case, there still is a responsibility here for us, and that is be holy, for I am holy. Yes. Because when we are holy, one, we represent the king yeah. of holiness and of glory here on earth. That's where you're saying. Yes. And yes. also we, we reflect what God is like, who God is to the world. But also we are the means by which the world is transformed into the holiness of God. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Yes. That we are, yeah, as you say, to shine that holiness, to show his love to our communities. Uh, and to represent his, I guess, in a sense, his morals, but how he wants his holiness to be. Holiness is a kind of funny word, isn't it? It's, I think the best kind of way of understanding it is godliness. So when he says, be holy as I'm on, that's kind of to be like God, to show his character, to, to exude what he wants, his principles, his ideas. Because you did also mention that we are, at, we are the temple where the Holy Spirit dwells, a temple of God. One, one of the things I know of temple is that it's a holy place, isn't yes. it? Because um, the temple in Jerusalem, it was where God dwelt and it was a holy place. That's why Jesus was cleansing the temple because people had made it unholy and he wanted it to be a holy place. So yes. if we are God's temple, it means we are to be holy. And because the Holy Spirit dwells in us, so that's why there's a call for holiness here. Is that true? Yes. Yeah. Great. That's what, that's what I was trying to get to. Great. Fantastic. So um, in light of that, Hebrews again, Hebrews is a great little summary of a lot of the Old Testament, the, particularly these 8, 9, 10 chapters. Chapter 10, we have the confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus. Uh, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain um, that is his body. So he took us there and then we can reflect, we have to reflect that holiness um, in our lives and, and to bring people to him through that. Um, to finish, I would actually like to just read a bit from Acts that talks about this where God is not stuck in a physical temple, whether it's you or me or the tabernacle or the, the old temple, God is everywhere and he wants this relationship. We can reach out to him without the physical requirement. And this is what Paul urges 
the men of Athens to do in Acts chapter 17 um, from verse 22. Paul stands up and he says, The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything because he himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. From one man, he made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he determined the time set for them and the exact places where they should live. God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him, we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Wow. I guess that answers the question. Is God still in the box? No. Is God still in the tent? No. Is God still in a big uh, building? No. He's everywhere. Yes. He dwells with us. He's here right now yes. when we speak. He's here where you are right now. God dwells with us. Is that? Yeah. And he wants us to reach out to, to him. him. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Mark. I really appreciate that. That was really helpful. I really enjoy that. Thanks, I enjoyed, I enjoyed particularly you expanding a little bit more of the difference between what was and what is now a reality yeah. about our, the presence of God, about where God is and how God speaks to us and the intimacy relationship that we have with God. And I guess I would love to pray. That would be great. Thank you. You might be here and listening and you're thinking, goodness me, I have done so much in my life. I, I don't think God can come anywhere near me. Um, I'm not holy. And because you, you guys have just said, be holy for God is holy. How is this even possible? It is possible through Jesus Christ, as we've just heard. Why don't you say, Jesus, I invite you into my life to be my Lord and my Savior. I am not holy, but you are holy and you can make me holy. Come into my life. I surrender my life to you. If you're not a Christian and you pray that prayer, you will receive Jesus in your life. He will come into your life. He's accessible. But for some of you, you're not a Christian. You, you are a Christian, pardon, and you are thinking, I feel like God is a bit distant. I feel like he's very far away. Or you've put God in a box somehow and you think he is just over there. Or maybe he comes when we meet together in a kind of uh, building somewhere. The good news is he is right there where you are right now, which means you can talk to him and you can spend time with him. You can tell him what you are thinking, where you are at, how you are feeling. God wants to have an intimate relationship with us. And that's what I'm going to pray into. I'm going to pray that we might know God intimately, even as Mark has just given us this brilliant, brilliant word about God dwelling in the midst of his people. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for how you have spoken to us so vividly about the fact that you are not in a tent or in a in a box or in a in a temple somewhere, that we have become the temple, we have become the place where God and man dwell together. But you are with us right now. I pray, Lord, for families for individuals here, Lord, for people who are just watching this and listening for the first time, who might be thinking, where is God? That we might know that you are here. You are close to us and you want to speak to us. You're not an absentee landlord. You're not up in the sky somewhere. You are here with us today. And I pray, speak to us, Lord, draw us close to you today, even as we draw close to you. We ask this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.
Thanks Mark for the message. What really stood out to me was that God wants a relationship with us. And as we just heard, this can only happen through Jesus. If you'd like to learn more about Jesus, then please do get in touch. At the end of the service, there's going to be some slides showing all the things taking place in City Hill this week. 
So keep your eyes out for those. From all of us at City Hill, have a great week and we look forward to seeing you next Friday at 10 a.m. God bless.